Hi there. We're going to begin our third section of this course looking at the diaspora African art, which are the works of art made by people who were brought to the Americas as a part of the Atlantic slave trade and the massive resettlement of African peoples all around the world through this extraordinary historic event of the Atlantic slave trade. To get a sense of the, the, the scale of this is really hard to fathom. There were about 13 to 14 million Africans who were sold into slavery, captured uh, against their will, and packed in like human cargo uh, between 1500 to 1880. Over this time, Africans uh, proved the important labor in the Americas to provide Europe and the United States with its essential raw goods uh, and luxury items, such as sugar and coffee, especially from the Americas. And these were things, and tea. And these are things that the labor shortage in these areas was so acute and it was so difficult and uh, backbreaking, they could not depend on the local natives in the Americas to do the work. They would just flee. So by capturing Africans and bringing them to Americas, they found uh, a very hardworking people who were used to difficult climates and who didn't know the countryside, so couldn't run away and hide. And so this huge movement of human uh, cargo was undertaken. It's an extraordinary cruelty of the 13 and 14 million Africans that were brought to the Americas, uh, something in the similar number, about 13 million Africans would perish in the journey. Uh, these absolutely horrific conditions uh, that they were subject to, uh, many would commit suicide rather than be sent into these captivity. Um, this was a credible human suffering that uh, was perpetrated for centuries so that Europeans could have a few luxury items. And this is a part of this enormous uh, historic event. And there were abolition that began around 1800 to 1880 that people who began to see the extraordinary cruelty of what was being done and what we see here, this diagram of the Brooks slave ship from 1787, this is one of the early diagrams that really sort of laid out uh, the extraordinary circumstances of the slave trade. In a kind of scientific detail, it described the you know, ways in which humans were transported across the Atlantic. And this was probably the single most powerful image that launched the abolitionist movement. People were horrified when they come to learn of the conditions of the slave trade. And this image was widely circulated um, throughout the 19th century and was instrumental in ending slavery. Moses Williams uh, is a, a worker who was a, a cutter of profiles. He worked uh, for Charles Wilson Peale, who had, was a, a well-known artist who painted the portrait of George Washington. Peale had a museum uh, and he had a, a collection of paintings that people came to see. And while they were at his art museum, they would have their portrait cut. And you can see here this physiognotrace. People would sit in a chair uh, and a light would cast a shadow onto a screen. And then uh, Moses Williams was, uh, would cut out their silhouette. Uh, he would draw it onto a card and then he would cut it out and then add a, a, a tiny details like the eyelash and things like that to give it a certain kind of freshness and vitality. 
Moses Williams was enormously successful at this. Um, he uh, was very well known. People sought him out for his uh, remarkable ad ability to do this skill. And he's one of the first African-American artists that we know of in the United States, a person who made his living as a, an artist. And while this seems rather humble, you have to understand the extraordinary difficult lives um, that he was in um, Philadelphia. And in this area, he had greater liberty. He was able to learn to read and write, and he was able to uh, present, uh, you know, an extraordinary skill that people valued. The silhouette becomes a very important part of our early African-American uh, iconography. It's a curious artifact of a time before photography, when a very inexpensive way of creating a portrait but it also does a very interesting thing to the racial character of the person being rendered as it does not distinguish people by the color of their skin. Everyone is in silhouette. And by that way, a kind of common humanity is formed in the nature of a silhouette. Another very interesting uh, artist that has come into our understanding was Dave Drake, who lived probably between 1801 and 1870s, uh, and who became a potter. And he also had uh, was one of the very few slaves at this time who had the ability to read and write. He was born into slavery about 1800. He was taught to read and write so he could work as a typesetter in a local paper. In 1834, the earliest examples of his writing appeared. In that year, it also became illegal for slaves to be taught to read and write. And if, it said, quote, slaves were caught reading or writing, they might be whipped severely. They might have lost fingers or might have been sold. There is no record that Dave was ever punished for his writing, though there is a six-year period when he added no inscriptions to his pottery until he was freed at the end of the Civil War, and then he took the family name of Drake. He was listed as David Drake Turner. In the 1870 federal census, a decade later, his name was gone from the census. So David Drake uh, made these large functional vessels, and he would, on occasion, uh, inscribe them. We know that he made about 40,000 pieces over his lifetime, which are cited and uh, dated, and sometimes even short messages, uh, poems, and uh, other little um, musings. So in a sense, he's not only uh, our first known named ceramicist, he's also a, a person who has a kind of poetic legacy um, that gives us insight into what he was thinking. Here are some examples of the poems he's written. Dave belongs to Mr. Miles, where the oven bakes and the pot biles. Uh, then he sa writes, what is better than kissing while we are both at fishing? The sun and the moon and stars in the west are plenty of bars. And a pretty girl on a verge Volcanic mountain, how they burge. And this one I find really funny. L.M. says this handle will crack. Now, for David Drake to L.M. Is, are the initials of his uh, master, Mr. Miles. And so for him to dutifully inscribe on his pot that Mr. Miles says this handle will crack. At one level, he's simply recording what his master has said. At the other way, he's giving evidence to the fallacy of his master's comments because the handle didn't crack. And to this day, the handle hasn't cracked. <laughs>
And so in some ways, even though he has a sort of a kind of subterfuge here where he's using his words to underscore the failability of his master. I wonder where's all my relation, friendship to all and to every nation. So David Drake, um, we know very little about his life and his, his work, but we have um, it's a very active community of collectors of his pots and his wares. And it's a, an extraordinary testament to his, his uh, intelligence and his wherewithal as a potter. Another very curious artifact from this period is the Topsy and Ava doll. And there's a lot of sort of misunderstanding about how this doll was used or what it meant by this doll. Um, they were common playthings for uh, young girls. Topsy and Ava was a blackface comedy routine. Uh, and they're also characters in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was this very important abolitionist novel uh, that had a, a 1927 silent film of the same name. Topsy and Ava became common alternative name for the Topsy Turvy doll, solidifying its link to the blackface slapstick brand of entertainment. But, you know, what were these used for? The common story is that this sort of blackface uh, girl on one end and the white-faced girl on the other would be so that when little black children uh, were seen with a doll, they could not be seen with a black doll. So they would quickly hide the black doll underneath the skirt of the white doll. But this story doesn't quite square with reality. These dolls were enormously popular, not just with black children, but also with white children. Um, by the mid 20th century, they'd grown so popular, they were mass manufactured and widely available in department stores across the country. And today they're mostly found in museums, private collections, and occasionally in contemporary art. Harriet Powers. Here's another uh, woman of, of great talent who was a quilter who wove, who uh, stitched into her quilts stories about events, uh, biblical um, uh, events and narratives, so that she had a way of kind of giving a voice to the history that she lived and experienced and uh, wanted to communicate to later generations. So this idea of the picture quilt, it's a way of sort of recording families and children and deaths and also uh, important events. We see here uh, a number of in, uh, narratives that she's stitched into this. The one at the top is Job praying. Uh, on the far left, Job praying for his enemies. Uh, and Job's coffin. And then number two, you can see there is a, a great star, the dark day of May 19, 1870s. The seven stars were seen 12 north in the day. The cattle all went to bed, chickens. This is a, 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 an eclipse. The sun went off to a small spot and then to darkness. So here on that second, she's recording an eclipse that happened. There's a story of Adam and Eve uh, with the serpent. You can see there on the fourth panel. Uh, and then on the second row, we have Jonah and the whale. And uh, we also have uh, Oh, the, the, in the far right there, angels of wrath and the seven vials, the blood of fornication, seven-headed beast and the ten horns which arose in the water. It's kind of uh, mythic imagery that she sort of weaves into the tapestry of her quilts. Quilting has been uh, a long tradition 
in African American communities using scraps of fabric and to kind of rebuild and remake uh, useful new quilts from old clothes and whatever could be salvaged. Uh, the Geese Bend in Boykin, Alabama, uh, began in the 19th century to have a kind of knitting section where they a, a sewing circle where they would work together uh, and build these really spectacular and beautiful uh, handmade quilts. So Geese Bend quilts had been just a part of local production and they had a kind of local following. It wasn't until the 1970s that they were sort of discovered and their extraordinary, powerful, abstract designs were put on display and sort of powerfully influenced a lot of abstract expressionist artists. They were just blown away by the beauty. Notice this here, made of old worn jeans. You can see the wear spots where they were on the knees and thighs and, and legs and patched together with these brilliant red sections in a way that just has this kind of wonderful, vibrant vitality. Now, what's really amazing about, aside from the visual spectacle of these incredible um, patchwork uh, quilts, you can get a sense of the community that comes together and collaborates on these to create this sense of exquisite design and color and fun. But if you really, they've interviewed the women and, and when they've talked to them about what it's like to be together and have a sewing circle, for them, the prime reason for, for doing the quilts is it gives them an occasion to sing. William Edmondson was uh, the first African-American to have a one-man show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 1937. Edmondson was the child of freed slaves his last name is the name of the farm just outside of Nashville, to which he sort of belonged at one point. He called his sculptures miracles. He just carved them in his front yard and sold them for a few dollars along with vegetables at his roadside stand. Now they sell for about a few thousand dollars. Um, you can actually go to the art museum in uh the Art Institute of Chicago, and you will see William Edmondson's work on display there. He says, I was just doing the Lord's work. He said in one interview, I don't know I was an artist until them folks come and told me I was. Another very interesting, we call these outsider artists, um, not that they are sort of physically outside or live in an alternate outside, but they are culturally untrained by, you know, art institutions and their work is often unknown and is a part of a kind of private uh, practice where they explore uh, a passion, an idea, a feeling, a vision, and this is where they, they work uh, in a kind of solitary way. James Hampton uh, was one of these sort of classic examples of the outside artist who uh, worked by himself for years and years, would go into a garage without telling anyone that he had rented. And then from all the things that he had found, light bulbs and cardboard and tin foil, and he began to assemble this vast, huge, spectacular uh, temple uh, architecture with, made from uh, furniture, found objects and things that he built. Uh, and he put them all together in this absolutely spectacular display. Now, this is only a small portion of all the pieces that went into, it was found in his garage at his death. This is now on display in the Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. It's one of my absolute favorite places to go and see this truly stunning work of art. Um, James Hampton's 
work um, is extraordinary. And if you look very closely at the very top of his shrine, in uh, which he made to the the unity of all mankind, he has written the words, "Fear not." Now, Meta Warwick Fuller was one of the early artists we have who was actually trained as a, a sculptor, had a real artistic training. She was skilled and, and in modeling, was able to work in like bronze casting and carving in stone and wood. And here we see her in a time uh, during the 1920s, early teens, 20s, she was a part of this new Harlem Renaissance. Harlem had been a place where a number of artists and poets and novelists uh, got together and formed a new uh, kind of movement to try and reform uh, their images and ideas about what it was to be a Negro, to be African American in America, and what was their African roots, and what is the that relationship that they had, and to take and create images that they could be proud of. And here, um, Meta Warwick Fuller is creating Ethiopia Awakening, this idea of this ancient ancestor that they belong to, uh, from Africa, and here uh, looking off as if rising uh, to this new awakening, this new pride, a new sense of who they are at this time, a kind of pushing back against the oppressive narratives of slavery. Another artist who emerged out of the Harlem Renaissance was Aaron Douglas who worked on a vast series of painting murals where he's trying to capture the whole history of the African-American experience. Here, uh, aspects of the Negro Light Pantu from slavery through Reconstruction. We see the cotton fields in the foreground and we see them kind of rising up and we see images of silhouettes. Again, the silhouette is very interesting here because of its legacy in African-American art. The silhouette comes a way of identifying their common humanity and not focusing on their racial identity and as a way of kind of seeing these sort of pulsing, uh, vibrant, echoing colors of the sounds of jazz, the sounds of, of things of moving forward. Here at the very end of his Aspects of Negro Life, he has a painting called Aspiration from 1936, where he really shows their goals, some kind of city on the hill, some work, the idea of a place uh, and a society where they are uh, truly equal. So these images of positive images were very much a product of the Harlem Renaissance, and they did not necessarily reflect the reality of their lives, but were a part of a kind of attempt to push back against the oppressive narratives that so filled their lives uh, up until this point. An artist who took a more critical or reflective uh, approach to the idea of the African-American experience is the artist Romare Bearden, who uh, was kind of a generation after the Harlem Renaissance, but during the in the middle of this sort of the movement, civil rights movement, and the struggle, and again this idea for Romare Bearden, the African American experience, African American experience was really a collage, a kind of jumble, a fusion of of pieces uh, like the sort of scraps made in a geese bend quilt. It's kind of coming together in a lot of different ways. Bearden uh, was an artist who studied under the German artist, George Grosch, who was very political at the Art Students League in uh, 1936 and 37. 
So often at this time, his paintings of the American South strongly were influenced by Mexican muralists, such as Diego Riviera, who's a socialist, and Jose Clemente Orsco, again, another active in social justice. Shortly thereafter, he began the first stints as a caseworker for the New York Department of Social Services. And during World War II, Bearden joined the United States Army, serving from 1942 to 1945. He would return to Europe in 1950 to study philosophy at the Sorbonne under the auspices of the GI Bill. So he was a very worldly man, he was certainly more educated uh, than uh, most of uh, African Americans at this time. And he was able to really uh, explore a whole new kind of vocabulary of the art experience here. Uh, is a collage from 1964, Sermon at the Walls of Jericho, where the walls of Jericho are tumbling down. 1964, this is the beginning of all the tensions and violence that's going on in the uh, civil rights movement. And you can see the tumult and the chaos and the violence and the uh, energy that he's trying to capture in that of that moment in his collages. His later work, we can still see the figure becomes important, the people, their faces, again, the kind of patchwork lives, unfinished and sort of uh, scrapped together. Um, and in a sense of a kind of harmony with each other and a, and a kind of community that is fractured and struggling. Here in a collage from 1970s, he sort of evokes a kind of Egyptian style figure with his patchwork quilt. Again, hearkening back to this idea of, of fusion of, of identities and disjointed possibilities brought together through the, this rupture in the history of the African-American. 